All right, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us once again for How Do We Go Forward, How Do We Go Back? Um, I am delighted today to introduce uh, my two guests. We have Benny Simon, who is an assistant professor at the Ohio University School of Dance and a PhD candidate in dance studies at the Ohio State University, where his research investigates the intersections of dance and technology. And we also have Kendra Portier, who is a dance artist, maker, teacher, and performer, um, an artist in residence turned assistant professor at the University of Maryland College Park. She is the director of New York based band Portier Danceworks. Hi, Matt, I am going to stop your video. There we go. Okay. All right. And Benny and Kendra are going to be talking today about digital classrooms. But first, why don't you, just, how are you both doing? What's the situation for you like right now? Kendra? Hit, hit it, Benny. <laughs> okay. Uh, I am here in uh, Athens, Ohio, which is outside of Columbus. There's no students. It's a very co it's college town, so there's nobody here. Um, and have, I think like many of us, ex been experiencing um, teaching online, figuring out how to do it, the uncertainty of what happens next, um, Zoom fatigue, um, things, like, things like that, but, um, but also finding ways um, finding creative ways to continue my work um, and the work of my students um, inside of this very strange situation. Yes to all of that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I am located in the greater DC area. I have been teaching online um, kind of forcibly so because the quarantine did this. At the same time, I've also been asking some of these questions. A lot of how I construct my class is, is based probably on what many of us are doing, but, uh, or have been doing, which is reading the energy of the room. So I think a lot of my questions are about how to connect, <laughs> like really, how do we connect? Um, how do I use my imagination as a tool? Um, to kind of envision people next to me. So I, I guess next layers of empathy are like, bring them in. <laughs> uh, that's kind of where my questions really are. And, and within that, I've been teaching some master classes on behalf of Free School and Lion's Jaw and taking as much class as I can in a variety of forms to just kind of see how other people are approaching it. Um, yeah, I, and in general, I guess I'm coming from a place of really trying to locate what is still possible in this platform, what is newly possible, and then also what is just impossible. <laughs> and uh, rather than kind of mourning or eulogizing what can't happen, I'm just letting that be a separate branch and feeling kind of grateful for, the, for this idea that uh, whatever we do here, no matter how good we get at digital dancing, um, it's not gonna replace being next to somebody. Uh, it could run parallel to it, but that, that gives me some comfort, oddly enough. So. Yeah, I, I, uh, I was sort of thinking about how I wanted to like, just reflecting on how I wanted to sort of structure this. And when Fen first suggested this, and even a couple, you know, a month or two ago, I was thinking very much about like the practical aspects of how do I do this online. Some of the things that Kendra was just saying. I don't know about some of the rest of you, but I spent the last five to six weeks of the semester replicating what I was doing in the studio on Zoom, and it it did not work. Um, and very quickly, the students um, it was very clear that that the kinds of presence that we can have, and that and as Kendra was saying, like the reading of the room was just not available to myself and also to them. They had nothing to sort of latch onto in terms of their the way in which they are able to navigate the class structure and what is going on and how they learn from each other. Those were just it was just completely missing. Um, so over those five weeks, we sort of continued to modify and modify where where we ended up at a position toward the end of the semester where I think nobody was really all that happy. Um, and, <laughs> and there was this real sense of this, like, I miss the thing that I, that I like to do. I can't do it fully in the space that I'm in. Um, uh, and, and I'm not, I'm not feeling satisfied. I don't want to dance anymore. <laughs> and, you know, some of them would stop showing up and, and just stop engaging. Um, and what I, what I sort of took from that, 
is that as we move into a situation where we may be online in the fall, like, I mean, different places are doing different things. We still are sort of in this sort of hybrid model. I really want to think like Kendra is talking about, about the way in which that these digital technologies can sit alongside our in-person experiences to amplify each other. I think it can go back and forth. Um, uh, we kind of always have been doing that. Um, my, a lot of my research has to do with um, intermedia work that engages with, with technology. And um, this, sort of, this sort of binary of, of, of em embodiment can only take place physically, I don't think is correct. I think that embodiment can happen virtually. It's just very different. And because it's different, it feels alien and it feels wrong. And it, ha it, it is not part of the curriculum that we teach and the way in which we structure our pedagogy. None, none, we, none of us have been prepared to do this. Um, so a lot of the, the frustrations that I'm finding is not because it doesn't work, it's because it's new. Right, right. So like the, the, the sort of models that we are also familiar with in, in dance class that have been around for years and years, I mean, it took years for those to develop. Like, and they're very, very grounded in a, in a lineage and a practice that is just so familiar. So when we're presented with this other thing, not only does it seem familiar, it feels wrong. Um, and I think my project that I've been trying to think about for the fall is like, how do I, how do I, for myself and for my students, figure out a way to start to introduce the, the techniques and practices of digital classrooms and digital learning so that it starts to not feel quite as wrong. And you can start to find a similar kind of satisfaction from that that is different than the one you get from that sweaty and I'm next to you in class, we're like rocking it. It can be just as valid and just as, just as enjoyable um, and become a little bit more normalized, I, I guess. Um, so that's kind of like the, the frame I've been thinking in. I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Can I interrupt and ask, what do you both see as the techniques of digital embodiment that you were just talking about? Like what, what are those techniques that you want to teach your students? Well, <laughs> um, yeah, while, while Benny was speaking, I, I think this idea of te technique this idea of training, I think a lot of us have always been questioning what we're training for, how we're training, um, both as a, as a teacher. I, I like to refer to myself as a, a host <laughs> of ideas. Uh, very often, I feel like that kind of helps me feel like I'm not at the center. Um, but I, I, I'm thinking about these techniques, and there is a part of me that is like, okay, well, what is... A, what is a, the, what are these pillars of technique, like alignment? Is that really what I'm looking for? Am I looking for, am I trying to see that somebody is working in a safe manner in their body? Is that still a priority? How do I access that? Or do some of the pillars of technique, meaning tools that help us dance for the, forever, <laughs> uh, does that get to shift right now? And do I, can I, embed some of the other things that I believe. For example, um, like how do I learn how to stretch my curiosity? Uh, and, I, and I hear that said in a lot of classes, but then I don't often know if, if somebody is thinking about it in the same way that I am, does it even matter <laughs> if they're stretching their curiosity? Um, am, I, am I accessing things that are often talked about like pleasure and, and actually physicalizing what it means to um, enjoy what I'm doing, to seek pleasure and how radical am I, is my relationship to that. I'm thinking of that as part of our technique. I'm thinking of, I, I know I hear uh, the J-O-D, the joy of dance all the time and I am into it, but then also recognizing that that takes some skill and it takes some practice. And so I think that um, this is a prime moment in these kind of dueling pandemics of COVID and also really like, we have a lot of work to do in, in terms of uh, decentering whiteness in our spaces. I think we've been doing a lot of work and we get to do even more and more and more, which feels really exciting to me. Um, so 
bringing that back into technique means for me, how, how am I, what, what's my priority in getting people moving? Is it really the same technique that I grew up with? Or am I now kind of extracting my own constellation uh, for techniques that I think are going to provide us a new future or a new way to have an individualized embodied relationship, I guess. Um, yeah. And the, I think the, um, the notion of seeing is something that is, has radi needs to radically, is radically changed. And we need to, our evaluative processes, like you were saying, like seeing someone's alignment, like is not available and there's there's a couple of implications for that for one thing like i can't i can't provide the kind of feedback and watch in the same way that i would in the studio but at the same time the other, the other part of that is that a lot of students who were already perhaps not as visible in class as they as they should be are even more invisible um and figuring out a new evaluative structure what are the rubrics by which i i i judge i mean everyone basically got an a at the end of last semester because i have I, there was no way for me to fairly um to fairly evaluate everyone they're in different places they have different access to bandwidth they have different spaces they have brothers and sisters and dogs and cats and, and siblings and and there's no there's no way for there to be an even playing field so i'm i'm trying to figure out like well inside of that what you're talking about that sort of like host, hosting these ideas what are the what are the ideas that that fit and are evaluated, evaluatable, <laughs> evaluate <laughs> in inside um, inside these kinds of different digital digital spaces. Um, I don't think that I can. One of the things I'm really concerned about is that if I if we end up with some sort of like hybrid situation where sometimes students are in, no, I agree with you, Matt. Like the playing field is never really even. Um, uh, it's just uneven in a different way. I think um, if I'm in the situation where. Uh, um, some some of the students are in class some of the time, and other students are in uh, are in class other other time. How do I <laughs> how do I grade that um, uh, and watch everybody? So yeah, I, I'm. And at well, the same time, in terms of assessment, I. I I, I'm sure this is a road that all of us experience because you hear it, you feel it as a student. I mean, as somebody who went and got their grad degree recently. <laughs> uh, it's kind of like, what the hell am I being graded on? <laughs> you know? Um, and then I, I feel that kind of um, rub when I'm grading people because at, at, at the same time I look at them and, and I, I feel like my job is to really try my best to see each individual and the ways that they're working and kind of sussing out the information as opposed to them learning how to demonstrate and perform their process. And I'm more interested that they have a relationship to the process versus able to perform the thing that I think I'm looking for. <laughs> uh, and, and I feel like this is a great opportunity to kind of scratch at that. Um, to, I, don't, I don't know. And we've talked a little bit about like, then there's also levels. You know, a freshman coming in needs a different kind of support than somebody who is both familiar with school familiar with living on their own, or I teach um, uh, an advanced modern class, which I often don't know what that means. <laughs> and it's, a, it's a, a group of seniors and undergrad, as well as all of the grads. <laughs> and so we're, we're talking about different things and I still hear, well, what am I training for? What am I training about? And um, I'm, I'm just really wondering about that longevity and their relationship to process. I'm, I'm still feeling as we translate or kind of reform our relationship to teaching technique or whatever the hell we teach to remote learning. I, I'm, I'm recalling how much every time I was um, given like a group assignment, how I could feel the dread <laughs> in me. And it's given me some space to like rethink what I'm actually asking for in terms of like collaboration. Am I asking collaboration to demonstrate a, a particular performativity of us collaborating together mm -hmm. like or am i asking people to be independent artists who enjoy a collective process and can i put that into the classroom in in this way um i don't know if i know how to do that but i am trying so hard <laughs> uh but yeah i'm just i really really like 
how can we get collective thinking for independent artists? And what is my role to facilitate that in this <laughs> space? I wonder what a, a curriculum looks like. I mean, we, we ask our students to take agency over their own practice, but because they're in such a structured environment where we're telling them what to do and where to go all of, all of the time, that doesn't really happen. I wonder what a curriculum, like especially for incoming freshmen, looks like if they were online that really engages with the idea that it's like a, like a support, like how do we support the creation of, of individual agency? <laughs> Uh, inside inside of a curriculum like that so that they can because a lot what, what I noticed with my students from last, last semester is that some of them sort of know how to do that and they sort of took ownership over what we were working on and like figured it out and brought some new ideas and explored it and and, got some, and others who have, have don't have those particular skills just floundered because they don't know they didn't there was no structure all the structures that govern their life were just like stripped away immediately and, and it was very uh, it was a bit chaotic um, uh, I wonder how to teach those skills inside of um, a technique class. That is a technique. Yeah. So. It does. It also makes me like, I mean, part of this is because I love taking as many classes as possible. Uh, I also love really goofy stuff, as Benny knows. <laughs> like, I'm into 80s aerobics. I love it. I would happily do Zumba. Uh, this kind of platform allows me to take classes that I feel embarrassed to take. Like, I feel like I'm never going to be cool enough to try this thing that like all the 18 year olds are doing, <laughs> but I can here. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I'm thinking about other things that have been helpful in, in kind of giving me, I don't know, a little bit of guidance or some structure. I'm thinking about like applying a, a whiteboard kind of thing like they do and I forget what it's called but it's like different kinds of circuit training you know you jump rope for 60 seconds and and maybe restructuring some of those things so that as the course progresses I can put a prompt up there that we've discussed in class I can ask we we kind of generate nicknames for certain movements so that I don't always have to go through the whole thing but one of the things that tends to come up are, is this dumb thing called cats. But I know I can go do cats for 30 seconds. And uh, that feels like something that uh, like people can just follow. I, I, I keep hearing from some of my colleagues too, well, how do, you, how do we know if they did it? And I have, I'm just like, <laughs> you just have to trust your students. Like yeah. the other side is, I mean, even if we are in real spaces, you can't, you can't make anybody do something they don't want to do and you can't make them care about something if they don't care about it. So we're just going to keep caring as much as we can. That's a really hopefully. good point. <laughs> like the, the caring thing, I, I, this is something that I, I'm sort of thinking about, which is there's an idea that a lot of my students have of like what legitimate dance training looks like like what, what, it, what it feels like and what it looks like. And because they, a lot of that is not available in their small spaces or whatever, it's no longer legitimate training. So even when I, when I can put forth something that this is really gonna be useful and works, but it, it doesn't feel the same. So like there needs to be like an expansion of what, the leg, what legitimacy means inside of training um, that is more open, um, especially folks coming in with like like hardcore like competition backgrounds and things like that, which is fine. They have some amazing skills, but they can't do those things anymore in the spaces that that they're in. Um, and the stuff that sometimes I, I feel like I'm offering feels less to them, like not as not as much as they as they want. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm interested in like what a new vocabulary of pedagogy looks feel, look, sounds like and um, how that can be bolstered by a department to say like no no no, we are all still dancing full out it just is different than the kind that you were doing you know the thing dancing happens differently in different kinds of spaces so. yeah um legitimate legitimate forms <laughs> um that's a that's a problem just in academia i think just in general <laughs> yeah like my heart just was like <laughs> yeah. but there, there's a perception of legitimacy that that I would like yeah. to move. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And this, this feels like such a, 
a powerful time to do that. And I think there's also maybe around that a le- what's considered legitimate teaching in terms of the relationships that they have to their current teachers as young people and the expectations of how they're yeah. going to interact with their teachers as they move into college. Um, yeah, like how to really stoke the work ethic and kind of braid in the joy and braid in the kind of like liberation of getting to dance full out and feel your feelings and to present that kind of emotionality as something that is totally valid, (laughs) that there isn't any kind of um, movement that's not valid. (laughs) Like, yeah, what about the hunger for whatever form you're in? I'm thinking about like the, the, the difficulty. I think a lot of my movement emphasizes a qualitative range that I'm struggling to see in a, in a screen. It's, it's hard to see the weight and it's hard to, to get rhythm <laughs> or the kind of like off kilter rhythm that I'm looking for, especially when somebody's stuck like this for a while. And I'm like, is that what, <laughs> you know? Um, but at the same time, I think those qualitative rhythms are so clear and practice when I see uh, people teaching hip hop and when I see people taking hip hop and when I see uh, somebody who's trained in house or who's just been practicing house because they love it, I see that they have a particular way of coordinating the body and relating that to a resilient weight that's both lifted in their pelvic floor and they understand how to move and redirect their weight in a way that I think is really helpful for my movement. And so when I, when I hear students have resistance, which, you know, we, we all do, we all do. I'm not even going to say students. I've felt it myself for various reasons where I think most of it had to do with insecurity <laughs> uh, more than anything else. I mean, the worst thing you can ask me to do as a performer is ask me to be like sexy or something. All of a sudden it's, it's like, dun, 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 <laughs> you know, there's just certain things that are tough and uh, they change depending on that person. Um, I'm meandering into a different thing, but yeah, I, I'm really thinking about like the, the legitimacy thing where I think the dancers I'm interested in and the ones that uh, I use or are asked to be in my work usually have uh, a proficiency in other forms that maybe aren't always thought of as legitimate. <laughs> um, but house has been around for a while. So part of me is like, it's not, it's not that new. <laughs> um, and alongside like all of these challenges, I'm also trying to like, how do I infuse the, like, you know, a, a, an anti-racist approach into everything that I'm teaching in, in different ways and trying to figure out what, you know, re-examine the things I've been doing um, and changing things that I feel like need to be changed. And uh, it feels like, an, uh, I mean, it has to be done, but it's an immense, immense amount of, of work, I think that we are um, engaging with as a field right now. Yeah. You know what feels exciting along those lines yeah. is, uh, is improvisation, right? Improvisation, at, at, at this moment, you think of improvisation, you think of postmodern, and with the loss of Nancy uh, Stark Smith, I feel like my heart is just so sad. <laughs> um, I feel so grateful for the things that I've learned through her. And then I feel at the same time, every time I go to or end up in a cipher, I can feel my hummingbird heart want to crack. (laughs) I am so nervous. Um, And I don't really understand why, because essentially we're asking the same questions. Uh, It's the same practice or similar practice. It, It has to do with kind of a fluency in the form, a fluency with the movement enough that you can riff on it, play on it, suspend it, do all of these things. You can make decisions on top of the movement that you've, you've practiced. And um, I, would, I would love to take this moment to kind of rethink, restructure something, uh, our, our relationship to improvisation in particular. Even if I'm, uh, as a teacher, I often fold in a variety of improvisatory prompts um, for a variety of reasons. Some of them are just goofy, which I I really think is helpful. (laughs) And some of them are 
are somatic or like there to access some kind of cardiovascular orisha, let's get our everything going. But um, yeah, it, it makes me think what I'm really asking about and how I'm asking in those impro improvisations uh, beyond how, how we've kind of decentered a lot of other ideas in the physical spaces. Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe we have like a few minutes. Left. Maybe we can just talk like talk about technology for a second. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a Sorry. No, no, no. It's just one aspect of it. Um, I I may I have encountered, as I'm sure you have as well, Kendra, like students who, especially being in here in, in Ohio, um, you know, students would be like, "Well, I have internet for two hours a day." Um, and then I have to go feed the livestock. So you know, it's like it's there's this real varying of accessibility that is is just not I think being accounted for by um, um, some schools in, in different ways. I don't I, I don't think a good solution is to just give everyone an iPad. That's not that's not really going to solve solve anything. Um, so thinking about the kind, kinds of assignments that and kinds of work that can be done in in a very in a strangely analog way, even though it's at a distance and has to be communicated electronically, um, those assignments were much more successful than the ones where I tried to do like let's make a like we did like one of those sort of Mitchell Rose style chain videos, you know, and it all worked out great. But oh my gosh, like the 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 coordination of it due to electronics was <laughs> was very very complicated and probably not worth the effort um uh so i'm really thinking about how i can be more analog inside of this digital um space in order to make it more accessible to those who don't have um the same kinds of resources that that i do or other folks other folks do yeah yeah even if there's um recorded downloadable voice so you can take it outside so that you yeah. don't have to be reliant on your proximity to wireless connection. Um, and of course, that also is like, well, hopefully you have a phone that can do this and that. Um, but yeah, like how, how many ways can I offer? <laughs> Here's the movement. Here's what we're talking about. Can it, can it even be like a short descriptive prompt and then you can go wherever you want to go with that thing um but i love that like how do i think in an uh, well how do i think analog i was actually thinking about like something like for the fall like if we're if we're online maybe i'll make like little boxes that we literally mail to them that have props or little things in them like prompts and things like that that they can open it up and do this and that. i don't know I think there's other ways besides this zoomy thing. Um, yeah, to... like the choreo cards. I think a lot of us have yeah. different choreo cards, but you could really be like, here we go, game number one. Yeah. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I like that. I'm, I'm finding in terms of technology, I don't, I, don't, I don't have the background that you have or the relationship with technology. And so there's also this thing that, I think once I figure something out or how to do the, whatever setup I have, it feels so makeshift that I have a doubt. <laughs> like there's like, it, it, it's gotta be a different way to set up my version of the sound and this and this and this. And so there's also this, this part of me that's like, okay, stop doubting the things that you did just because you feel like they're makeshift. Just add that and then go see how somebody else is doing it and keep gathering these like, uh, technical logistics, how to set up sound and communication, given whatever we have. Um, yeah. That sounds yeah, like a wonderful thought for me to actually pause you on. Benny, did you have a last thought? I just, I just was going to say, I, I set up this thing where I had two phones acting as cameras so you could like see me like a front and then two side, one from the back, one from the side. So you could see like, all angles and it ended up being like way more confusing to follow, <laughs> to follow than, than just like the one angle. So yeah. Yeah, sim sometimes simpler the better. Thank you both so much. That was really fascinating. I love all the different takes you took on the digital classrooms prompt. What I would love to do now is uh, participants who are here, who are 
right now you are welcome to add back in your video or unmute yourselves. Um, and if you have questions, I would love to hear your questions. Or advice. Or Benny and Kendra. Or, and what's often happened is if we run out of questions, then we will have a more free form conversation. But I think maybe we'll start with a question that Matt put in the chat while everybody sorts their tech out about evenness of playing field. Um, and let's think about equity for a moment in digital classrooms, which we kind of got to at the end. I mean, it's not, you know, yeah. Um, I think I worry about the expectation that the, administ the, college, the administration has versus the on the ground experiences that we have with, with our students and those not ma matching up. Um, oh, I saw a cat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and so many people have so many different realities that they're dealing with and there's just not, we can't, we can't meet them all. So I think kind of lessening my grip on mm -hmm. what I expect myself to be able to do. Um, yeah, and also maybe setting some more parameters or boundaries for myself so that I don't somehow end up teaching 16 different classes because my heart hurts for them or like finding ways that they can still engage with me or in smaller groups with each other. Um, yeah, I, here on Maryland's campus, there are some students that are still living here and so they get to see each other. I happen to have a grad student who lives beneath me. Uh, so how can I kind of arrange different working groups so that they can utilize each other um, and provide access for one another as well. Um, that doesn't always have to go through me. <laughs> I'm curious about, Melissa, your experiences doing some online art stuff with you. Yeah, well, our department is, um, it's kind of a nightmare, to be honest. Um, so, hi, I'm Melissa Yes, and I work at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, a short drive from where Finn is in Tuscaloosa. Um, yeah, we, uh, you know, we pivoted really fast, just like everyone else in the fall. I wasn't teaching that semester, but I am teaching this coming semester. And, um, you know, for those of us teaching things like graphic design, it's kind of a no-brainer. We can do a Zoom screen share and, um, you know, make it work. But for things like printmaking, sculpture, darkroom photography, there's really no way to actually replicate the studio experience in an online platform. And what I'm witnessing right now is the faculty who are teaching those types of classes are struggling because they're saying, I actually just don't, I'd rather just not teach it at all because it's not going to be the same. And so it's a shifting right now of, I think, our own expectations of ourselves and recognizing that we're not going to be able to give our best instruction. We're not going to be able to um, be our best selves, really, as we have known it to this point. And, um, you know, I've, some faculty in our department are really flexible with that, others not so much. But there's also the larger issue of lack of control and clarity within the institution itself. Um, just before this meeting, I texted with thin a little bit because we're under the same UA system even though we're two different colleges and it turns out um, our two colleges are being given very different information about how we're allowed to proceed according to the same uh, guidelines um, which is pretty inequitable and so I'm thinking also now about um, like the, the possibility of resistance among faculty and maybe even the possibility of, of resistance among adjuncts who I think are going to be bearing a lot of the burden. I'm going to pause here for a second and just say that, if, that Melissa is going to be talking next week um, with another artist, Alexis Stelianos, about blending careers between freelance art making and teaching. Um, so you should absolutely come back next week and hear that as well. Yeah. And I also just did a bunch of rambling, um, so so maybe it sparked some various thoughts in the rest of you. Yeah, 
Yeah, we've gotten really confusing messaging <laughs> on what's expected. Um, and, and I recently was on a, a panel about, or with other faculty who will teach in a laboratory setting. And, and I was, we were each supposed to go around and kind of talk about or help identify maybe like five things that were really troublesome and in us teaching remotely. And, and I, as I went through them, I was like, yeah, I mean, this, this, this is, there's a version that can happen. And then the person after me was like, yeah, I teach sculpting and I'm supposed to be teaching welding. So <laughs> like how, how are we going to do that? Uh, since that moment though, he's uh, been generating ideas on how to do community outdoor projects that feel really uh, aligned with uh, various public art street art, um, murals, like he's, he's been really innovative and kind of looking for all these different ways to collaborate with different disciplines and that feels exciting. And it feels like he's also been told no, no, no <laughs> by a certain administration. And I feel like what he's trying to do is so student forward that it does inspire, he's been here for a, a much longer, I've only been here for two years uh, and as a guest really, um, but it does inspire me or remind me that like, I do have quite a bit of power in my own resistance to teach the way that I believe I need to be teaching and to go to the folks that could help me do that. I say that and then I'm like, ah, oh, shit, what, what do I do? <laughs> I would love actually to ping Jessica on this one because Jessica, I know you've written a lot about shifting pedagogy and resistant pedagogy. Um, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot, could you chime in? I don't mind. You can say no. <laughs> no I, <laughs> I, um, I actually was, was kind of starting to hone in on that as, as you were talking, Benny, you brought up um, sort of re-examining our work for anti-racist approaches. And Kendra's response is where I want to pull a little bit at this thread of she went, Kendra, you went right away into talking about improvisation and I'm just that transition to me was really fascinating. Like, what is it about what we're thinking about as an anti-racist approach in this environment that needs to involve an improvisatory um, approach or an acknowledgement of individuality or an acknowledgement of the student's autonomy and agency in the space that they have to bring what they bring with them in, and that we will accept it. Um, and it seems like there is something in that that feels necessary right now. Um, there is something about the idea of improvisation that, I mean, my background and my teaching is in ballet, so this is really challenging in terms of how do you, how do you prompt that investigation in a classical form? Mm. Um, and what does it mean to be an improviser or what does it mean to improvise and what does it mean for us then when we look at our assessment models and how we're um, valuing or uh, changing the value that system that we're bringing to the room. So I, I just want to poke at some of those questions because I found that transition just so natural and easy and understandable and it was really clear as to why you would go that way Kendra and and at the same time it feels like there's a lot in there to, to pull at. So that I, I, I hope, Fen, that's where you wanted to go with it, but. <laughs> yeah, you just reminded me of um, Sabela Grimes. I, I forget which California school he's at, maybe Long Beach. He, in one of his classes recently, um, he teaches usually a hip hop form. Uh, he he kind of came up through Rennie Harris, but he was talking just about this action and comparing it to Tondu's and saying, this is a meditation on this action. A tondu is a meditation on the bottom of your foot to the floor and you just keep doing the same thing until you get more out of it. And, and like ideas like that stick with me as this, this relationship between what we're investigating, uh, using anti-racist techniques, <laughs> uh, to, like acknowledging the culture that is ballet rather than just like discarding it, just acknowledging that it has a culture in itself. And yeah, it feels like such a rich territory that I am fascinated by. Another thread that of the sort of resistive 
or potentially resisted acts that I've been thinking about is I, I realized like the last week that I've been spending a lot of time being very concerned about my students, like the health of them and how are they going to be okay. And there's and a lot of the planning that OU has been doing is very much around, you know, keeping students safe. And then I was like, wait, what about me? Like, <laughs> like, do I if we're doing a, you know, do I want to go back into a studio? I mean, regardless of how many um, procedures we put in place, like it's, you know, dirty. <laughs> it's going to be, it's, it's going to, people are going to interact. We can't control everybody all of the time, nor would we want to. Um, and I, I'm not, I don't know what kind of voice, you know, we have to be like, well, wait a minute, like, I mean, I want to be back in the studio, but also kind of, I don't. <laughs> um, so I don't know if anyone else has experienced similar, similar feelings. And do we even have a choice about it? I don't, I don't think I really do, so. I can yes. speak for here. It feels like at, at UA, the culture down here is very, um, um, say it's very um it's very alabama i i don't i don't don't know a nice way to say it um it's reminding you that you're being recorded yeah, yeah i know <laughs> that, that, that's why i'm being careful um there's a culture here where i go to the grocery store yesterday and 50 percent of the people aren't wearing masks at all aren't taking any care people are coughing on each other and most of those people are college age kids uh, the, uh, and I, I, don't, I don't know how to move forward in that kind of state. And I was honestly extremely surprised that the University of Alabama system went forward with the, the break at, uh, in March 13th and is still pursuing hybrid classes and stuff like that. I thought they would be steamrolling full steam ahead. Um, so I, I, I'm, I myself am surprised at the level of caution that has been taken, um, despite the culture that is saturated here against that caution. Matt, you don't need to put a hand up. You can just jump in. Okay, all right, I'll jump in. Um, one thing that I wanted to state is, uh, I think an important conversation about each student's individualism is that they're giving and receiving um, their artistry to each other. So, and, and they're experiencing each other's ideas and their artistry. So if we find ourselves in a space that is entirely online when you're moving into your artistic classes, where you're dealing with their subjectivity, are there any thoughts or ideas that anyone has on how you will um, help them to share their own individual artistry with one another so that they're experiencing each other's subjectivity? Um, this is just what, one example, uh, which does not address the entirety of the question, but one perhaps from the ground example of how I was asking students to interact uh, and stay physical. Uh, any style of movement that they wanted to work with, I asked them to create a duet. The first person danced with a, piece, a wall or a piece of furniture where they were in some way. And then they sent that to the second person who then had to uh, experience the levels and the weight and the, the beat and the rhythm that, of whatever that was. So that it ended up being a duet. The first person also selected music so that there was some sense of rhythm that the second person could find as well in their response to the first person. So I can imagine that being a longer conversation between more people so that they can get bits of information from each other. Because that's one of the things I love about class is that we're all teaching each other and that is so impossible on the Zoomy. So how, how can we keep each other as teachers is what I'm trying to figure out. One of the things I did in comp, comp class was, um, because we got tired of just making solos. Like you, there's only so many solos you can ask people to make. Um, I put them into small breakout groups and they had to choreograph like a group piece together. And what was interesting, at first it was very 
awkward. But then they start to figure out like the logistics of how to like do it when you can't see everybody all of the time. And it ended up with these really interesting sort of intricate timed kind of entry exit kind of things that were happening when they performed it that uh, was was quite nice. So they were they were definitely teaching each other how to how to make work in that setting. I totally agree with you, Matthew. <laughs> I'll definitely just say that I have been primarily, oh, definitely in the fall, I will be teaching two theory classes. So I th am thinking about how not just to show, I, I, I absolutely 100% believe that scholarship is artistry, um, but thinking about how they can show their artistry and creativity as thinkers to each other. Um, and actually one of my most joyful moments of last semester was I, I had two history classes a week in the first, the first class of the week, I delivered a bunch of building blocks. And then the second, they, I put them in Zoom breakout rooms of maybe four or five. And I had a list of discussion prompts. And that's all they did was small group discussion um, based on prompts and sources. And goodness, they got so deep into things because they had, they had small group support and they had some daring to address difficult topics that they were finding, they were a bit of difficult to address in front of a large class. Like there's a maximum size group of people where you want to start talking, for example, about racial inequity. So thinking like just a plug for breakout rooms is a really great way of getting students to take on the responsibility of supporting each other. I, think so. I was gonna suggest something similar too. Like, I don't know how it would translate to dance practice, but, um, it, the studio critique and studio art courses is something that we're always trying to make better because it has some, it just has some challenges. We get exhausted, they're long, they really re they take a lot out of us and it's really easy to fall into a rut. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually think that this distance learning provides an opportunity for us to let some of those more introverted students find ways to participate with more confidence. And I actually have been planning to use breakout rooms like you suggested, Finn, because um, first of all, it's hard to sit in person together for a full critique of everyone in class. And it's going to be just impossible on Zoom. We're all going to take naps. So, um, so yeah, finding a way to do that, but still to check in and moderate the conversations to make sure they're going as planned is, is my task ahead. And I, you know, I'd be really, it's easy, easier for us in visual art to put an image up of our work, but I'm, you know, I'd be curious to see if, it, if something similar would work well for movement artists as well. The, that breakdown, um, I teach directing and stage management and for be, beginning directing courses for all intents and purposes, that's really what they are doing is one student is directing two or three of the other students. So they are breaking up into these groups of three or four and then sharing that work with each other. So I think um, if we find ourselves entirely online, I think um, exploring how I check in with them, <laughs> you know, in those groups of four and, and, and really uh, receive their uh, way that they are, directing their peers is going to be a, a big part of the um, experience for me and, 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 and their learning process. Now, Matt, would you, um, would, you keep, would you keep those groups of four intact through the whole semester or would you mix them up uh, as the semester progressed? Usually with the first uh, project that they do for beginning directing, whether we're in the space or, or not, or if we're online, uh, they'll work in a group of four on a project, one play that the entire class is working on together. So they're each approaching a different scene from said play. And then as they move on to their second project for this semester, there's more individualism in that. So they're each taking a scene individually and then working with uh, one or two of their classmates who are helping them as actors. And those are very short scenes, three or four minutes long. So everybody has their individualism expressed in that second scene that they work on. Uh, related and probably not <laughs> at the same time. Um, I'm, I'm just he, being, I, I'm reminded that like, I think something that came out of ballet was I was so, um, 
aware that I would always ask my friends to watch me. And something that I see in modern is we don't often go, hey, Benny, will you watch me and give me feedback? It's, there's something about this practice that feels a little bit more like, I'm just gonna navel gaze my way through this phrase or something. Um, but what I, what I have noticed in this interim, both related to and kind of in addition to uh, academic coursework is that people are really inviting each other to take a class together. And there oh, seems to be a, a culture developing where people just check in after that class that they took, whether it is with their professor or they invite their professor to take a, a workshop with them that they've never done before. And that's something that I feel like uh, I've never been able to do. It's impossible to participate in everything that all the students want to do, but it has been something that I've gotten to do for myself and with them. Uh, and I see them doing it together a lot. I hear that they're doing it together and that feels um, a, a good place to kind of build more exercises or kind of um, structures around. Yeah, I, I noticed that we, I mean, we, we had a, a Gaga week planned in the curriculum where, but I, which I don't do that form, but we were gonna you know, learn about it. But suddenly they were able to do it <laughs> because there's, you know, the, uh, there's classes every day. So they got to experience a number of techniques that we just don't offer and, and can't, can't, can't provide. I think what was lacking in that experience just because of the nature of like, hurry up and figure out this stuff at, uh, at the time was a, a, a reflection and a, a, a um, an engagement with the context of what they were what they were doing um, in all cases, um, but I, I would like to keep that as, even even if we're back in the studio. Like I'd like to make that part of the the, the syllabus. Where I, I mean, I'm hoping that some of these classes that have gone online will will stay will stay there. Will be continue to be offered. Not maybe not necessarily in a in the same volume, um, and we can you know fund them in whatever way we need to. Um, so they can try things that we can't we can't provide because you never know like i mean a couple of those students came back and were like that was i have to do this for the rest of my life like this is amazing <laughs> um so I, I would like to do that all right we are getting pretty close to time what i usually do is at around 6 30 slash whenever we run out of questions i'll turn the camera off so we can all breathe and defragment um but before that point, are there any kind of final questions? We've, we've gone into very nuts and bolts things. We were at a very kind of more pulled out um, perspective. Do we have last thoughts that people have that they want to share? Either, either thoughts or questions from anyone around the subject. I'd like to echo what Benny said earlier about... Um, I see you, Jessica. I'll get you next. Oh, sorry. I didn't see you. I, I apologize. I'd like to echo what Benny said earlier about um, the, the highlight that this uh, event has brought on accessibility. Some students don't have Wi-Fi. They don't have a home computer. They have to share it with their brothers and sisters and, and, and so on and so forth. So what, when we assume that, okay, yeah, submit your thing on Blackboard or submit your thing on Turnitin or, or all that stuff, we're finding a greater emphasis and finding those, those not loopholes, those, those people who would, uh, who would be lost, who would fall through the cracks and who would otherwise just be like, oh, I, you know, and, and not tell anybody about it or um, just try and, and break, break their backs trying to make it happen. Um, that I think it's what's helpful is that it's highlighting that accessibility issue and hopefully that's how in moving forward, we're addressing that even when we do get back to a new normal. Yeah, it's, a, it's an equity situation. Oh, I'm sorry, Kendra, do you want to no, go ahead? No, 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 all you, all you. Um, I, yeah, I, I agree with you, Matt, that the, the, uh, the sort of coming to light of inequities is so, has become so tremendous when you can see into someone's home and you're seeing several people's homes at the same time you see what students have or don't um, in some pretty sort of tangible ways um, and what they have or don't have access to. Um, I also 
came away from the semester realizing that the students' processes of dancing inside their own bodies and in their sort of internal monologues had shifted. Um, a lot of them were, had fed back to me, fed back to me by the end of the semester that they were able to, um, for example, not showboat their way through a class because there was no one there to watch and there was no mirror for them to self-judge and there was no me standing there as the authority figure um, with a with a red pen and I I I think that's pretty brilliant and I'm trying to find ways to maintain that when we get back into a space where there are those sort of external eyes on you um, where they were really able to go I mean certainly somatically in a real sense inside of their body and map the internal nature of whatever it was that they're doing in a really productive way, in a way that feels really healthy to me in so many ways that we see students sort of beating themselves up in class, um, self-flagellating and mm -hmm. making it, making it um, an environment that feels a little fraught to me. I think a lot of that went away and there was this sort of calm and ease and self-acceptance in a, in a really great way that I just, I would love to, I agree with you, Benny, that there are some things definitely to hang on to that have come out of this. Yeah, I was just going <laughs> to say the same thing, but not as eloquent as you just did. But yeah, it feels ironic to have our interaction in a two dimensional space and to have it be this kind of like viewingness where it somehow that that is giving us all the privacy that we we try and practice in together spaces. But really, even I'm still an A plus student, I can't help myself. The moment I go to a class, I still want to make sure that I am trying my hardest to demonstrate uh, <laughs> what I think the teacher is trying to get from us. And I can feel that at my age with my experience and, and how tough that is to deal with yourself all the time, you know? I would like to layer on, I 100% I agree, and I wonder how we can now then give them the language and uh, skills to be able to do that kind of self-evaluation because we'll, because we'll, we'll check back in and be like, how did it go? Good. You know, <laughs> I want, I want more than that. You know, like, like what were you working on? And like give them some real structures in, in which they can um, uh, self-analyze what they're doing in this more individualized kind of space where it feels more free and they have more um, agency. I think on that question, I'm going to leave it hanging there and I am going to stop the recording. Um, but before I do, I would firstly like to say a thank you to all of you for coming along and being such like, wonderful disputants. Um, and particularly to Benny and Kendra for their fantastic conversation. Every week I, every week I enjoy these conversations more and more. They are really, they're valuable, they're honest, like they give me such a great sense of hope going forward. Um, I hope you'll come, like, I, I would love it if you would come back and join me next week. I am about to announce the July schedule. Um, so we will just keep going because I think this space has been really valuable. Uh, Thank you so much, Ben. <laughs> I am, I stopped, I, the